She's into some fucking weird stuff that I like, though. Not the fucking gungeon that before you fucking <laughs> rip into me. Yeah. Just leave the cock pump videos on, so everyone just thinks I'm a weirdo. Puts a bit of girth on an inch on there, fucking boys will be thinking, you know what, let's go. It's Don't get me started on this, bro, I know this. I is know that a joke? If he's watching this pod, Jacks O'Neill, and you want to scrap a good one against the game motherfucker from Castleford, shout me. Fucking real. Let's go vlog this. How can I be homophobic? My bitch is gay. Hit man in a top chat, see a man topless. Even Welcome back to the podcast, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Where do we even I wonder start? Wonderful, feel rusty a little bit. It's been oh, a few. I think we'll be sweet. Yeah. I enjoy these ones. Don't feel any pressure at all compared to when you've got a guest on there. Mm. Tell you what I do want to start. We were meant to do a podcast just before I went on holiday, weren't we? And I wanted to talk about Amsterdam because you've yeah. got some funny stories from there. Good trip. I think we stayed at a little bit of a two posh hotel. Right. Yeah. But two the, posh what for you or? Yeah, I think a little bit of overkill with price and just where we were. I think it was one of those hotels where you should probably be dining there and, and, and leveraging that. We, we did none of that. It was just from the room. The location you're paying for there as well. That's a big thing for me in Amsterdam is... Cause I'm not the best smoker. I sometimes like to just go back, back to room for a little bit and then straight back into madness if needs be. Yeah. Remember when I went last, early this year? Yeah, we were joking about that because we were just having a bit of fun when we were in coffee shop. I was like, just visualise Ellis now on a bit of a spiritual journey. He's, he's come to a coffee shop <laughs> with a book and he's not even read first page. People are going to be, I bet he's paranoid thinking, what? Well, Oh, big time. And it's madness that you actually went to the Bulldogs. Mm. So we, when we go there, the the key for us is to find these more chilled coffee shops, which I like. We found one there called High Times and, and Goa Coffee Shop were our favourite there. Just more relaxed. But someone did collapse there, mate, in that go horn. Talk me through that and what the fuck had the well, guy been taking? I'm always... How do I explain this? So, so weed is obviously more accessible than ever over there. There's, there's coffee shops everywhere. But... That's going to bring people who probably aren't accustomed to weed. It's took me a long time to get a decent relationship with weed where I can smoke it and be in public. I always want to just sort of just get this overwhelming feeling that I want to flee or fucking run off or whatever it might be. But we were in there stoned and they had a really nice weed in there that we were using. And I would just sat there with her relaxing, having a drink, whatever we were doing. And, and, and a Chinese kid just literally collapsed. But everyone was so high in the coffee shop that no one reacted for, it must have been at least a minute. And then he come round, I was just like, fucking hell. And he walked past us, just so high. I think he must have had some edibles or so he's just some more in his system than just smoking a couple of joints. He just looked at me, just went, wow. <laughs> and then he I, wonder, went, I wonder if he remembers all this. I think you would, but he, um, and then as I came outside, he was just like, sorry, 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 sir. Mm. Like just, just, in a pickle, and mm. he was just left by himself, so which would have a bit of a shame. But anyway, I think with Amsterdam as well, because it's like a nice place to go. That it probably brings a lot of people who have never even smoked weed to probably just go for like the views and the sights. Yeah, end up smoking weed because it's one of them drugs where you underestimate. You can underestimate yeah. it. I did it when I first started smoking. I ended up a bit silly of me when I went to Kane's thing, just smoking a full joint to myself as mm. fast as I could because one, it's when we're in the house and I wanted to do it and get rid of it, and two, I thought that you had to smoke a full joint to get high. Like now, even if I did that now, it'd fuck me up. And it did that when I was like 15, first time I'd ever had it. So he's probably gone there and thought, I'm going to try weed today. It can't be that. But everyone seems to be looking fine. And I can see people smoking, still having a conversation, yeah. probably smoked a couple of things and just thought, what the fuck's going on here? And the reason that people probably didn't react so badly is because they probably see it all the time. Yeah. So there, were, there were a little bit of panic. I even saw it from owner. Yeah. Yeah, well, owner. They've got, got like a bit of sugar in them and then they're good to go. Mm. And I think that's why they give you the, the I could never figure out, is that they're making money from the drinks, which they obviously are, but I think they want you drinking sugar and what they serve so you just you aren't just passing out. Mm -hmm. um, but what I, what I found there, which were interesting when we were in coffee shops, is just the wide variety of people, like old people eating edibles and just crazy shit. And we did a little mushroom trip. I tried, the first time I tried the, what they're called out there, the truffles almost. Truffles. Yeah. Good, good I, experience. I, I weren't brave enough to take loads. She didn't like it. I thought she would be. I think you'd like it. I just don't think you should be going out into public when you're high on the mushrooms. 100% not. She, we we seem to have a bit of a trip slash sleep and then just get out into sort of city and she was a little bit on edge. So did you start in the room? Yeah, mm. which I like to I do. I feel like 
I don't, you, I don't know if that's the right way around. You think you should just take them and just I fucking think with truffles, like it. when we watch Ben Marsh's pod, it, like, if you take a certain amount and everything's glowing and it's a mint experience and you're not going mad for a, like a spiritual journey, then it's a good idea because you can do it. Everything's bright, everything's heightened, the yeah. smell, senses. Then if you start feeling a bit like, well, maybe it's, I want to go back and have a bit of a spiritual bit now, then you go back to your room, then you do all your, whatever you want to do, meditating, manifesting, whatever. Mm. I feel like if you have them in your room and you're locked in, then you think, oh, I'm all, I'm all right. Then you go out, it's yeah, a fucking it's a whole other world. Like I think the part with me, though, probably sounds like I'm a little bit pussy because I'm just there with my missus. There's a job to protect her as well, and sometimes I probably yeah. don't, don't like that feeling of being too out of control. Vulnerable. Yeah, and that's what I feel like sometimes when I'm stoned, So and on mushrooms. Yeah. But if you went with lads, it'd probably just be a fucking... Well, me and Holmes, who went here, were a different animal, just yeah, a free-for-all, just do whatever you want to do. Yeah. Have you seen the voice now? I can't remember who shared it now. That, and it's a girl. She's sending a voice note to a friend about um, a stag and hen that went to Amsterdam. No, what's that? Let me tell you this story. So, man and woman are getting married. They've both got a similar friendship group. They both wanted to go to Amsterdam, so they didn't fly out at the same time. I think the, fl the stag flew out first, and then a day or two later, the bride and all their lot flew out. They didn't mix with each other. They might have bumped into each other if there was going to be, but probably didn't. One of her friends who was a bit of a loose cannon, I think she was like one of bridesmaids or whatever, had gone with her friends to, you can go to these dodgy shows, you might have been there, I've not been there, where you can do like a glory hole. All oh, right. <laughs> so I've, not, I've not been in glory hole. <laughs> <laughs> you walk into a room, there's fucking an old day, stick your dick through, someone's going to suck it on the other side. Hopefully it's, you know, not the opposite sex that you wouldn't want it to be or whatever. So this woman goes in, she's having a laugh with her mate, someone puts her dick through, she's there sucking it. And at the end or whenever you want, there's a button that you can press and it makes the screen go clear and you can see it of a person. But if you press it and they don't, you won't see it. But if you both agree to press it and see, you'll see it. So after she's done this, they both press it. She looks up and it's a dad and dad's over oh. there with stag. So she just sucks a dad's dick. That's Everyone intense. found out. The girls all had to fly home, split all the family up. Bad do, imagine that. You can't be doing glory holes. I think that's even you a bit can't. intense for me. There's some weird stuff there where you can like sit in them booths and there's a, Something going on in the middle. Mm. I've been to sex shows and stuff there, and they're funny. Mm. But I remember going with um, Sam Holmes. I think I might have told this story where he, he's straight on stage, and but he got pulled off by yeah, wife. Come misses. on, come on, get off, get off, get off. It's understandable. Do you think? I think so. Imagine. Yeah, but, yeah, but why? So if you go into a sh sex show and it's interactive, you can't be then frowned upon if you're the person who's who's the person's doing the act. I don't know. That's what I just felt. Yeah, I feel like she probably <laughs> didn't. She probably didn't think about what could possibly go on there. And then when it's when he's what were they getting him to do on stage? He would have sat on his hands and she would just like fucking gyrating, yeah. tits yeah. out and, you know, just a bit of fun. Yeah. I mean, you've got to put yourself in her shoes, haven't you? Imagine if that were you and there were a bloke swinging his dick about and got your missus on stage yeah. and swung it in her face. It did make me think though there because this, every time I've gone to this city of Amsterdam, it's, it seems to be getting better and better and better. When I go there, I feel, I do feel, cheesy as it sounds, I feel at home. It's a safe, I feel it's safe. I can't really gauge how people are making money. But when you when you travel in, you can see that it's definitely city-fied. There's banks and there's there's definitely business mm -hmm. there. But in that sort of canal area, in in the where the square is, I don't know how they're all making so much. I think dough. a lot of them people have got all online stuff. They all can do, you know, like what people did in furlough, sat and work from home. I think yeah. they can do that, but yeah. they probably work for a worldwide company. I think. I think I passed him. I didn't speak to him or acknowledge because I, I I weren't sure if him, your friend were there. Yeah, mm -hmm. right at the. The coffee shop right next to the the grand where we stayed. Yeah, he's it's like been in and out of living there for a couple of years now. I think he's got a few connections over there that he's friends with. And I went I went over there probably three or four years ago to stay with him. And there's a guy called Yap. What are they are they involved with? We can maybe blow this out. Are they involved with growing it there and moving it around? What do they do? Yeah, and shipping it over and giving it to because the thing about Amsterdam is it's legal to smoke in shops and buy and selling uh, buy and smoke in shops, but you can't you can't grow weed there. You can't smoke it on the streets. You can't sell it unless it's in a shop. And people from the shops are not allowed to import it or grow it. So, so that don't make any sense. Literally, though, how are they getting that weed? It must be a grey area where the police know what's going on. It's there, definitely surely. a grey area. But bro, uh, Amsterdam's riddled with gangs. Is it? Yeah, it's all like, I'm not going to say mafia, but it's all like gang. What, Russian gangs? I think there's a bit of everything there. But a lot of, a lot of people go there on run as well. It's kind of like a Marbella place. But well, you can just hide there and just... yeah. I know people that knew when I went over there like had guns and stuff like that. Yeah, it's so. intense. We need to get a boy strip out there. Definitely. I think I'd like to let me air down there and just be at ease with boys and not just thinking. Because you do have to look after the woman. You've just been to yeah. Morocco there and you know how it is. You've got to some, somewhat play their game and, and do what they want to do. And I think Amsterdam's a, a... You can definitely... I'll go every year for my birthday with her, but it's just... You could you could film a fucking right vlog out there, bro. There's a place 
it's about an hour away from Amsterdam. So when, this time when I went with Vash, it's called, it was called Ying and Yang. It's so like Ying Yang or whatever. And it's basically just this big, it's like a big mansion slash villa that they've just turned into like a brass house basically. And mm. it's got swimming pools, a restaurant, all that sort of stuff. And Ash knew of it and he's like, come, we'll go there. So we'd, we'd had a couple of beers. Had a couple of nose beers, don't we? <laughs> nose beers, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> and then we pulled up. They're, they're looking in your car like, yeah, go on, let them in. They're not cops. Like, we went in there, pay your fee. I think it was 50 quid to get in. They give you a bathrobe. Don't wear anything underneath it. So you have to go in there and get a shower, put this bathrobe on. We walked into the bar bit, full of rich gangsters, like old people, a couple of young people, and probably 60 women just walking around. Some of them in nothing, some of them in just bikinis and stuff like that, all straight up tens. Me and I think we're about 25, 26. Me and I should like walking through like nervous little kids, like a few nose beers. Yeah, it's an intense it. environment, that, isn't it? Very, very intense. So then we'd sit down and I should like, I, I want Hermie. I'm going, like, we're in five minutes. It's like, I'm going for it. I'm like, oh, no, no. Like, wait, there could be yeah, better. Could, the thing there, you've got to be smart because you can fall in love straight away in there. I think Ash did. But yeah. to be fair, the girl that he was talking about were unreal. She was like a, she was like a short, quite muscly Brazilian looking, not muscly, but like tight Brazilian looking over big ass, big, big tits and that. And he's like, no, I want her. She was clearly the best one there. And I was like, no, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Like, we, we need to see everybody first. And you don't look too keen. We've just walked in. And if you blow your muck now, you're going to want to bounce straight away. We've just driven half of this. And just so I understand there, is it the same rules when I went to Cologne where it's not timed, it's if you'll blow your load? Mm, no, I think it was timed. Oh, timed. In fact, it definitely was timed because the get. So I'll, t I'll go through the story. So we wait a little bit. Everyone's going up to this woman. So she could tell she was a bit of a hot topic. She bounces off, and I'm like, oh, and he's like, dickhead, I wanted to chill with her. Like, so then we end, we end up talking to a few people, got a bit pissed, went to the bar, and these two birds that were obviously workers came over to us, were talking to us. One of them was sound, one of them weren't great. Ash, again, fell in love with this one. He's like, oh, I, I, I'm like, what about your other one? And he's like, no, nah, I'll, I'll come back to her. So Ash pretty much How much per transaction? 50 quid. So 50 quid in, 50 quid per transaction. I just, I'm, it was a cheap night for me. I'm one and done. So Ash pretty much chose the girl. I was going to go upstairs. And I'm like, whatever, I'm not going to argue. Went upstairs. For some reason in my mind, I'm like, do the business quick. And then I will probably done in five, 10 minutes. And I'm like a bit anxious, like I'm wanting to get, I'm getting ready. She's like, oh, you, you've got 25 minutes yet. Do you want to do anything else? I'm like, I'm all right. Well, do you want a massage? And I'm like, uh, yeah, go on then. Laid down, got like a five minute back massage. And I'm like, oh, I, I want to go check if my mate's out yet. What, <laughs> so what, what's the paranoia that they're nick your stuff? I want that. It, 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 it was decent. Like it, I trusted it. It's just... I don't know, once I'd done the business and I was a bit like... Uh, Get me out of it. Yeah, it was one of them. So then I come down, waited for Ash for ages. Ash must have probably paid a bit more money to do a bit of extra time or something. Come down and he was like, oh, wanting to find that other girl then. He's like, I need to find her. I'm like, bro, like... He's on a nose beer rampage. Yeah. <laughs> nose beer, blue pill rampage. And they then, take blues as well? Uh, yeah, definitely did that. Fucking hell. Definitely did that. Well orchestrated not, attack. But not even needed, just like precautionary. <laughs> And then just drove home, <laughs> just drove home, mate, through Amsterdam fucking streets in X5. I think you like can that. get, obviously when I'm going with missus, we stay away from that sort of side of it, but it's definitely there, isn't it? Yeah. I think that place has actually been shut down now. Has it? But there's, there'll still be places like it. How was the, we'll dive into some topics, but how was the Morocco trip? Good, mate. Yeah. I just, the only, I thought, you know, when you said to me before, like, what are you going to do though if you can't leave resort? And I'm like, I'll, I'm happy chilling. But because I'd left my hand luggage on the train and it had the laptop, gimbal, notepad, what else were in there? Air, uh, headphones, all that sort of shit. I were a bit like, oh, like, fuck, I'm, I wanted to do some work. I wanted yeah. to get some shit done. But then Emily was like, just see it as a sign that you don't need to do any work this week. Just chill and create content or whatever. And I was like, fine. So good all that side of it. But after like three or four days, of just sitting next to the pool reading a book and that like, you want to get out somewhere. So we did go out and went to markets there. And to be fair, there were loads of like, it was like basically a Manchester market, but times 20. Just full of fucking dodgy Moroccans, mate. It feels safe. It felt safe because... I don't, the Alton Rockins are just little Weasley guys that are not going to be able to do fuck all. But um, Emily was like, I need a toilet. So we found this little cafe. Just uh, the Prophet Muhammad must have, it must have been like meditation time. Uh, meditation must have been prayer time. So uh, that was just blasting fruit speakers everywhere. Went into this little cafe. I said, Oh, we'll get two coffees, please. Emily was like, Have you got a toilet? Yeah, sound. Went to go into the toilet. Oh, someone's in there. So she's like, All right, and wait. This horrible looking like Muslim guy comes out. And she's like, Oh, I don't want to go in there now. Was bloke toilet must have done so the the guy who took us into the cafe went oh just give me a minute must have gone in there to try and clean it up a bit and she went in came out two minutes later she was like that was disgusting i was like why she like there was piss all over there's no flush on the toilet it absolutely stunk and i was like oh i'm lucky then i thought i need toilet now so i went in there the root the ceiling were well low 
it was narrow as fuck. I don't know. I, was, I, I couldn't even stand up in there. I've got a little video on my phone, put it on. It was just absolutely disgusting and it was like a dodgy place and just full of little like weird Moroccans. And we went back into the market and we just, I prefer, I like, get me back on that resort. Apart from that, mate, it was good. Though. Nice weather. Decent people worked in the resort. Nice. Do you like that time just to sort of digest and have a little bit of a think? Yeah, it, bro, it's it's done bits for like, you know, when you're stuck in a rut and you're just in that same routine, which I've just been in for probably three or four months, just breaking that routine, getting out there. And they say that you you think of ideas and you like do stuff when you're bored. Mm. And that, even I'm on holiday, when you're sat next to a pool and your missus has got headphones and you're bored, mm. so that's when all your good ideas come down. And luckily I was just able to write them all down and reading that book and probably found like 50 or 60 golden nuggets, which I'm well, just off, off top now. of your head there, breaking down those 50 nuggets, what's the main takeaway that you can think of? One of them has um, shone a light on how much me losing disciplines affected everything like my performance. Mm. Um, I was just listening to a thing this morning as well, which added on to it, which was stuff like, if you set yourself a task and don't honour it, discipline's like a muscle where if you if you set yourself a task and don't honour it, you, you weaken that muscle and you... you next time you set yourself a task that you could easily fail. Like, let's say if you go to the gym and you, you want to do 10 reps of 100 kilo, you get to eight and then you're like, ah, oh, fuck it, I can't be after doing them next two. You rack it. Mm. Your next set when you promise yourself you're going to do it. It's so easy for you to not stick to them reps because you just did it. You just fucked your discipline up there and you did, there were no repercussion of it. Yeah. You, did, you didn't get punished for it. So you're just going to do it on your next time. Yeah. It's the same like smoking weed with me. If I say to myself, I'm going right, to go see Josh or I'm going to go see Keegan or whatever and, and I'm not going to smoke. Then I go up there and I smoke. I'm like, I, I enjoyed it. I, I got stoned. I've had a good time. I didn't get punished for it. Why not Why not do that next time? So it just proper weakens it. So that's one thing I've, I've took out of it. Well, the lesson in there, and if you really unpack that, it's people like to make promises to other people or make commitments, but if you're not keeping it to yourself, that's the ultimate, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And only you know that. And it must register in some deep subconscious that it's always there. Mm-hmm. It makes complete sense. That. I don't know if you've ever listened to Jocko Willink, I don't watch a lot of his stuff because it's intense, but he had a part on there where it says discipline equals freedom. And he's big on that, you know, personal accountability. And it's massive across the board that. Yeah. We were just saying earlier, weren't we, that it's it's hard. We can, we can piggyback off onto this this idea of comfortability and, and, and being in the same spot. It's probably a little bit hard for us sometimes because of where we're located. And we always come back to that, don't we? Just the, yeah. the, the circle of influence that you've got on the people that you're around. If they're not striving and pushing and trying to become better, then it's easy to fall in line with just sort of your surroundings. Mm-hmm. And it's, uh, it's a thing that I often think about that because even when I had nothing and I'm around these people and these businesses, it it raised my bar up, you after, because you want to be like them. And we talked about it just walking up there. Then, you know, when I go to these race weekends, these, these are high-level operators, successful business owners. Obviously, they're spending hundreds of thousands of pounds to race and do all this stuff. It's... It's a different level of thinking, and, mm. and, and, and you can soak that in. We struggle sometimes here because there's, there's zero access to it. No, and if you think about it, the people that we surround ourselves with, I know the fighters are pretty disciplined and stuff like that, but they'll, we, I mean, we don't spend that much time with fighters, but let's say as usual friend groups, they're not asked about being disciplined. Mm. They've, they've got no repercussions whatsoever. It's like Ben came to my house last night, brought a joint round and I was just like, I'm not smoking that. And he's like, come on, it's, it's my birthday. What is birthday? Yes, it's my birthday. Come on, like one more smoke. And I'm like, no. Because mm. I did this before my fight, like two, three days before my fight. I'm like, I'm fighting a couple of days. He's like, mate, come on, you want to fucking smoke this guy? And I'm like, yeah, you're right. Give me a smoke of that. Um, if no one's there to hold you accountable or they're not even holding themselves accountable, you're not going to do it. I did it. I mean, I did it last night and I think I'll do it from looking forward because my mindset's different to what before me holiday. That's one big bonus I've got is the discipline side of stuff. So just. <laughs> to, to to action that, what are you doing? Just having a list <clears throat> to do each day. and Because and, when's the cutoff? You, you mentioned Ed, Ed Milet at the coffee shop there that his working day is sometimes six hours, sometimes four hours here. Of probably deep work. And obviously that man's probably got a lot of leverage. How are you dictating a successful day in your head though? First of all, with the discipline, I'm, I'm acknowledging that that's now 100% been a factor that's contributed to me slowly being less disciplined and getting less done and slowing down more. And What, the smoking of the weed? Smoking of the weed, vaping, eating shit food, not honouring stuff that I've put on my to-do list or, you know, my, my daily list, like maybe it'd be editing or filming a reel and I'm like, oh, I can film that tomorrow. And I've just, whereas now if I write some on my list, I'm honouring it. And when I wake up, I'm going to I'm gonna write out the most important things and the things that I want to do the least at the top of the list. So I do them first. How I feel today is not a result of what I've done yesterday or this morning. It's from from weeks ago. Mm. 
And if I'd have known this a couple of weeks ago, I could have looked even further back. Whereas I want, I was trying to look for, oh, I don't feel so good today. What can I do today to make me feel better now or tomorrow? And it's not like that. It's a small 1% of things that you've got to keep chipping away at. And I know that if I start today being disciplined in every single thing, it's going to strengthen my discipline muscle. And that's just going to slow. Because a massive thing is, you know, like we don't see as, we'll both be honest here, we don't see as like family that nowhere often. Nowhere near as Nowhere near should. enough. And when I do, it feels like I better go and show my face. And you're, and you're rushing back to get back to your own 100%. Life. Whereas that guy we just mentioned there we're talking about in coffee shop, the YouTube guy, he says, is that the door knocking? No, it's these fucking drilling outside. You're not, you're going to see your family isn't distracting you from the goal. He'll get up on the morning, he'll go and do his training session and when he's better in the gym, he's better at work and then he performs good at work because he's, he's disciplined and he's keeping everything sweet. Then, if he's good at work, he's good in his family life, he'll come home, he's in a good mood, everything... All flows to one another. Under Is he for fucking real? Let's go vlog this. Do you know what's absolutely crazy? 87.8% .8 of our viewers are not subscribed to this channel. When we first started this channel, the goal was 10,000 subscribers by Christmas Day, but that's never going to happen without a little bit of help from you. If you're enjoying us content, you like listening to us podcasts, and you really want to help us reach this goal, please hit the subscribe button. Turn your notifications on so that you won't miss any of his episodes. And in return, I promise you right now, I'll make a promise, the guests will get even bigger, even better, and I guarantee we'll make the show as entertaining as we possibly can for you. So please hit the subscribe button. Thank you very much for supporting the channel. We really appreciate it. Now you can go back to enjoying the show. You can't write it, boys. You can't write it. <laughs> hey, yo, fuck me. I felt it bad day. We must be slowing down. I don't know, I'm just trying to get someone's attention. Yeah, if you're knocking on front door, fucking knocking on windows is not going to miraculously put someone else in the room. <laughs> Even though we're in the room, we're ignoring you. Quick. <laughs> Fuck's sake. Now, let's get back to that. So, we were, you were discussing there the, the Ed Milet concept of that. If it's personal discipline in the gym, it flows into all other areas of life. Where I think a point to touch on there for us is that we're probably in a period of his life now where it's work is a priority, us being a a success is priority and what have you learned from him that like you've got to flow them all together but do you not think Ed there if you really dissected this I'd love to be able to sit with these people at length there will have been a period of his life I can categorically guarantee where he were obsessed with the outcome of being successful because then it allows the leverage on the other side yeah but he was probably in the same mindset as what I had and he's probably learned from it that's how he knows because my mindset was right let's say I want to just focus 100% on this podcast and that's it I neglect only fans. I neglect yeah. seeing my family. I, re yeah. I, re I neglect seeing my friends. It, it has a negative effect. If you just focus on that one thing and everything else falls apart, I don't go to the gym. My body gets shit. Yeah. My body gets shit. My only fans don't work. Yeah. I'm not filming my only fans. I'm not seeing my family. I hate myself because I'm not giving them the time and love that they deserve. Whereas if everything's good, you're happy. I've gone and seen my family. They're really happy. We've built a better relationship. Nice one buzzing. Now I'm going to go home. I'm going to do all my work. Oh, right. Now that that's out of the way, now I can focus on my only fans. Now my money's coming in. So everything just boosts each other up. Whereas I was in the mindset that if I'm not boosting this one thing up, nothing else matters, but it does. So that's that's probably one of the main things I've got because he says how, like- How are you dissecting that though? Where do you decide where the focus needs to be? Does it need to be in all areas? Well, let's let's say the gym, it should, like you say, putting that on your to-do list in a day, it shouldn't even be on there. It's a non-negotiable. You should be training whenever you can, wherever you can. And it takes fucking an hour or two, it's mm. nothing. Like I can just get up an hour early on the morning if I'm, if it's that important, and I've got I've got what sixteen hours in a day, yeah. And then my focus, like I said, if it's it's on the biggest task or the one that I want to do the least or that that I need to do the least. Uh, no, sorry, it's on the one that I want to do the least. So let's say if it's an awkward phone call, I've got to have. There's a book that is it, it, Eat a Frog. It's something like that. You'll I'll we'll pop it up here, but that's that thesis. Right on the to do list, the one that you don't want to do the least is the one you should do first because you're motivated there, yeah, yeah, if that makes sense. And once you get the big job done that you've been avoiding, you're like, fucking hell, God, that's out there. Yeah. It brings your mood up. And it's rarely harder than you think. Do you find that the case? Sometimes yeah. when you're procrastinating on a task that you know you can probably get done in a couple of hours of deep work, once you've done it, you're like, why were we waiting to do that anyway? Mm. I had that mentality for university. 100%. I, let's say I had a deadline for an essay. I always operated on what needs to be done in two days, I've got to do it now. Yeah. And then you'd perform. Yeah, It's probably a bad mindset, that. It, bro, and it gets even worse than that because some of the stuff that I avoid doing 
it's stuff like I've just fucking we, my house has been sold for four or five months. They they might email me and say, "Oh, we need we need you to get permission from your maintenance company that you're going to change name over." I won't do it for six weeks, and then and then when they get in touch, like, "Oh, we need this to move," I'm like, "All right, yeah, I'll do it." it fucking text me ten seconds, mm. and I just avoid little tasks like that because I just can't be asked thinking about it. And a lot of time, it says in this book. All we ever want to, we, we only ever want positive stuff around us. We only ever want to do stuff that makes us feel good. We avoid the things that make us feel bad and we avoid the neg- negative stuff when really you should be facing that sort of stuff because you need that balance of mm-hmm. having a negative challenge and then having something that's like a good thing. And that's what I, I, that, that's another thing that's going to get me to face the negatives, get the awkward conversations out of the way because I avoid awkward conversations when really your life would be fucking 10 times easier if you had them, whether it be yeah. with your partner or your family Agreed. or your friends or whatever. There's like a, a clear line there of, this notion of discipline and a notion of motivation. And I think for me, being really critical of myself, when when you fall into a little bit of comfortability, if you're just waiting for motivation, you probably won't get fuck all done. Discipline is doing the things you don't want to do when you know you should be doing it. And, and, and that should be an ethos and a mindset for most, I think, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Because if you, for me, if I'm only going to be waiting until I'm motivated, fucking hell, it could be a couple of days, it could be a week, it could be a month for some people. But for me, it's... It's getting back to that disciplined idea. Like when I had nothing, I was more disciplined than I am now. So that to me breeds a little bit of ill will and a bit of contempt in my life. And that's, you probably got it bang on there. It's made me really think that that if you're not keeping the promise to yourself, you're fucked it, aren't you really? Because you're most important. It sounds narcissistic, but like if you can't do that to yourself, fucking hell, what's the point? It probably bre- it probably falls into all other things. Are like you showing up to your family? Like so they're your partner, your business partners, whatever it might be. Makes sense that. You know, when people say, oh, where do you see yourself in this amount of time? Oh, what would you say is your perfect life? And you always think like, oh, living in this house and driving this car and doing all these sort of things. But then when I'm listening to this guy this morning and he's like, imagine a life where you, you're fully busy achieving every little task that you set throughout your day. Even if it's like, he said he, when he wakes up in the morning, he could pay someone to make his bed, but he does it himself because that's his first discipline that is ticking off that's making his discipline muscle yep. stronger yep. on a night time he'll set his clothes out for the next day he'll pour out a litre of water ready on the side and when he gets up he, he wears them clothes he drinks that litre of water he makes his own bed and that's just three disciplines ticked off and then he's like my day it sounds silly saying oh, I'm ticking all these small things off but I'm just my day flows perfectly and I perform 100% he's 56 years old or something like that it says people say to him like oh, have you got so much energy when it comes to work and training he's like I've just so I'm so disciplined now my life seems easy. It just mm. flows perfectly. And that's what my life's been missing, the flow. I've, I, I get stuck in a rut. I waste time watching stupid videos that I don't need to watch. The biggest lesson that I learned through myself that wasn't like forced or I wasn't actively trying to learn is I spent barely any time on my phone at all. You'll have noticed I didn't post fuck all on social media unless it were like the odd thing. I don't sit on my phone if I'm in company of Emily anyway. And when I didn't touch my phone and like take anything else in, you actually get so much more thinking time. This morning I set my alarm for six in the morning woke up, did all my stuff, stretching, tidied, ripped my notes down, didn't touch my phone until seven in the morning because mm. I didn't let my phone dictate my day. If you look at your phone, you've got emails, text response to videos. Yeah, you could get lost attention. in that. I'd do that every day. And that's what I do. Every, mm. The first thing I do, I roll over, I grab my phone, stop my alarm, check my notifications, check my text. Yeah. Sometimes I'll just sit and watch a video and I'm like, what the fuck yeah, You can lose doing? hours doing that. Bro, so many hours. So that, that's... You see Danny Christie's post? Which one? I haven't seen Danny post for a while, but he put something like that that his biggest regret would be at 50 looking back and just fucking wasting time. That's that's like what that's I, the ultimate regret. You get to 50, like I'm 35 now. You get to 50, really think about this. If you've wasted your time and achieved nothing, imagine that feeling you've got. No wonder suicide's only fucking up and all stuff like this because you have to live with yourself. Mm-hmm. That's the biggest fucking dread that's in the world. That's my fear. And that, that one of my biggest motivators when it came to doing the OnlyFans full time, I was like, I could stop doing this now and I could be a site manager for the rest of my life and maybe become a project manager and maybe become a fucking mm. big boss for a Van Ohms. Or I could actually give it a shot when I know I can make money out of it because I know if I'm in my deathbed at 80 years old, let's go older and go 80. And I, I look and I think to myself and I'm like, oh, fucking hell, what have I just done? I've just robbed myself of a life there. That's the one. I saw Danny Christie's post about um, Dave Courtney. Mm. Um, that's sad. I didn't really know Dave. The, I tell you how I, how I first heard of Dave Courtney. Tony Hall, who lives on your estate, he was somehow involved with him when he was younger. Um, him and John Thomas, stuff like that. So I first heard of that name, and obviously he's been at BKB events. I've seen him at BKB a fair bit. Yeah. And then obviously we've watched... You haven't watched the full video yet, have you? Help to do with suicide upsets me a little bit, so yeah. I'm a little bit cautious of 
what I was saying, but, I, you know, to... I don't want to give the the details of probably what's happened there, but obviously he's, he's took his own life and he's, he's left a message for his family. How did you find the message? Well, when I first saw that he'd killed himself, was it yesterday or the day before? Um, I looked at the comments, because I think that a lot of people who were in the know probably put something in there, and most of them was, uh, he'll have been sat at home drinking in his own thoughts, taking drugs, doing this. Then I saw people saying, I know Dave, he loves his mum too much, he wouldn't do that to her. There's definitely been a murder or something like that. And obviously I've seen the message this morning saying this is what I filmed right before mm. um, it did what it did. And it was a bit of a weird one because it started happy. You were like, I'm doing this video. Um, I'm, I, I'm sorry that it's the coward's way out, but um, I've had a great life and I'm still having an amazing life and I'm grateful for everyone. But one thing I'll say is I'm struggling. I'm in pain. I'm struggling to get out of my car, down my stairs. I've had that much of an amazing life. I don't want it to take this decline and yeah. go that way. I want to just sort of end it as it is. But then he turns to, he focuses a little bit more on what people are going to say about him. He's like, I know millions of people are probably going to say, because I've had a life of crime, they're not going to shine a good light on me. Um, they're not going to glamorize crime, but it's been good. I've achieved this much. I'll probably have people saying comments. And, and then he focused a lot on someone accusing him of being a grass. There must've been something come up um, where police had actually made out as if he'd snitched. So he took the police to court um, because of that. And then the video kind of ends abruptly. He doesn't seem to give out a last message. So I don't know if the video goes on any longer than that or if it's just cut off. But yeah, it was quite sad to see that someone in good good enough spirits mm. to be able to film and not get upset could film it and then moments have to do what he's done. But You just never know. I had this chat with Holmesy. Like you just never know what's going through someone's head. Dave Courtney's might be a... You don't know what's going on there, but just in terms of anyone who's suffering with mental health, and I've, I don't think I've ever got to a point of, of been suicidal, of been thinking to want to take me my life. But for what happened to me when I was a kid, and, and I've been around people who are, who I can clear as day see as suffering, for that to be the only way out, it's a fucking gnarly situation to be in. To really think about that, and his his, his sort of concept there of, of what he's done, it, it might be his own, but like. Even with some people who are in good health or whatever they're doing and not pain, obviously there's a lot going on internally to make that decision. But that is a fucking there's a ripple effect with suicide, and 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 people don't see that. I don't think. You know, he mentioned there the cow's way out. It's impossible to to discuss it or even for me to try and understand it. I look at it with my dad. There, it's what's going on. Someone sent me Billy Basto. I'll actually post. It's an awful picture of me, but I'll I'll share it because it made me think about it a lot this week. He sent me a picture of me and my sister. I'd have been like, it, it, it was the last picture um, before my dad died, that, I, that that was me and my sister. And, and to leave kids like that, it's fucking crazy. So sometimes I, like, I digest and think about it that. I am somewhat proud of myself, me, because a lot of my family, I think they were just happy that I didn't become a fucking bum. Mm -hmm. 100%. So like that, like for people who are suffering, like to me, there is, there's always another day. This is just what I want to say. It's, it's, it's hard because men don't speak and, and, and men struggle internally and, and they suffer in silence most of the time because you there's this idea that you've got to be strong, you've got to be a provider and you've got to do all these things that you, you deem to be a man, but there's always another day. Even when I'm down or... You know, I've been depressed before. 100% I've been depressed before, but I just can't get into that mindset of of taking your life. It's... It's really deep to me that, and I, I, some people will be say, "Who are you to speak on that?" But it happened to me when I was a kid. I had to like live through that for in a weird time in my life. You're like you're still a kid, but you. I was aware of well, fucking hell. This is this is definitely probably created a big trauma in my brain, and probably a lot of the characteristics that I've got now is because of that. Hundred percent is mm. massively. <clears throat> have, have, you ever, have you ever had therapy with it on that? Never had therapy. I reckon that would be a good thing to just mm. like spend six months of your life just, I know you said you texted me the other day saying that you've had a time to like think about stuff and unravel stuff. I reckon if you sat in six months worth of therapy, you'd learn a lot about yourself, how much it's affected you and mm. you'd probably come outside. I just look at it, I probably look at it too analytically there and me discussing that when I've done a lot of internal work on it and really thought about it and had to, I were ashamed to begin with me. Like, I was really funny with, with going, not going back to school, but, you know, like when Slamane said yesterday, he mentioned it in terms of the fight and that, what would other people say? 
I was always super aware of that, man. I didn't want people to bring it up. I didn't want people to mention it. Yeah. And it took me, it took me many years to actually face up to the fact what, what had just happened there. And I weren't in control of that. So I can't like now at my age of 35, I'm just like, it is what it is. It's weird though, because for me, it split the families up. So like I was really close to the masculine side of the family and that just sort of dispersed straight away. Like I have nothing to do with them now at all. I've even asked to speak to me uncle and he just don't want to speak about it because probably at the time there were a lot going on. And let's just say I use, it's deep to think about this, but we're close. Let's just say you were struggling and I didn't help. It must be tough that, that if you wake up one day and you're gone, yeah, you, you have to live with that a little bit. You know, if you, if you could have had some influence on the, the outcome. And so I don't know if that side of the family is like that because you probably, as far as I'm aware, my dad were a strong character, a lot of friends, X, Y, and Z. For him to do that, it probably people just can't even, whoa. Just what the fuck even happened? My granddad just operated a little bit different. He just didn't even accept it. He even tell me. I had to find out how my dad died through finding a death certificate. Just didn't get didn't get talked about. Mm. Or almost like that with my granddad's mentality, like, like, like that's done, move on. And that was just his philosophy with it. And he sort of like just brought me up then. You know, he said there's always another day. Um do you think that or, or you said there's a ripple effect and there's always another day. Do you feel like people are in that position? even acknowledge that or the even no I, th I think i think if you're in a hole and you know you mentioned there just we are disciplined you're one of the most disciplined people i know so sometimes i want you to reach the success that you want and i want you to reach your potential i always bring this up to you because i've always seen you as someone who's got potential but if you're in a hole for a year two years and it starts compounding you don't really see any way out and that's the the you wake up to that depression you go to bed with that depression you operate through your day with that depression I feel really look, and I've really thought about this, that it's an instinctual decision. Like whether it be through drugs, drink, or just an unstable mind, once you've made the decision, you've done it. Because when I found that death certificate and it said consistent with hanging, like imagine you going through that yourself. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like mm -hmm. you've had to find the noose. You've had to hang the noose. You've had to put your neck around the hoose and you've had to kick yourself over. Mate, that is fucking crazy to think about how people, and and it's when I studied suicide a lot. Then I shouldn't laugh, but I mean, I, I wanted to understand that mindset of someone in that sort of dark space. And women usually do overdoses, but men just have this thing with hanging. It's like a, you rarely see women who hang themselves. Men, it's that that's usually their outcome, a, a way mm -hmm. to resolve it. But like mine were at the. A cafe where tenants store is there like our family owned that cafe there right at the end which is like an indian now it were it used to be papadinos mm. that was my dad's gaff it. and uh, just did it in office in there so someone's got to find you and whether they kept it from me there were no letter there were no sort of there were no closure to that so my closure for that was just going to the grave in a little bit and just sort of getting upset initially and then just been probably mentally calloused and strong enough to be like right that's I've got, to get it. I've got to carry on with my life now. Mm -hmm. Because then, it's a hard way to think about it. You, you could carry that victimhood all the way through your life. And what, what's that going to achieve? That's just going to pause my life. Especially as an 11, 12-year-old kid, year five. Like, fucking hell, the direction that could be, it could fucking ruin a kid. Just took me a little while. It probably did ruin me stuff because I was like right into my rugby and I ended up fucking all that off. Then. I didn't get into rugby till a little bit later then. But like, I was a decent little athlete. And that just sort of, you're rudderless then. Mm. You need men in your life. Like society needs strong men. And that's always been a big thing for my life. Like, let me lean into how do, I, how do I become a strong man? That's not just through fighting. That's just through being mentally strong and and building intellect and trying to understand people. That's also all, all it's about. You know, we bring this family thing up here and money and stuff like that. The only thing that's important, mate, is the people in your life. That's it. Mm -hmm. And you should want to be successful for those people so you can provide and, and do all stuff like this. But it comes back to that. And the world that we're in at the minute, mate, that's probably like, it's just the society's moved away from that. It's it's selfish. It's like, what's in it for me? And yeah. victimhood. And people just live with that identity all their life that the, that like, who, like it's someone else's fault. Where you've got a tech, because I could go to council and it probably would help. But 
what is it going to fucking... Me revisiting that repeatedly. Yeah. I've got my own book That's... to write. I've got my own chapter <clears throat> to fucking get yeah. after. I think it's only good if you, you know something's torturing you a little bit yeah. somehow or keeps popping up or there's something that you're holding on to. I think that it pops up when I do go. DMT. Does it? Yeah, speaking of DMT, have you? No, I, I ain't done it again. Are but you wanting to? It does pop up. It just takes me straight back to that. And and I'm like, what do I want to keep revisiting? That's why I get put off by that. What do, what, do, I, need, do I need to keep maybe, revisiting but it? Maybe the reason it takes you back is because there is something in your mind subconsciously that you need to mm. just go back, like acceptance, yeah. something like that. Well, maybe, may, maybe just accepting that. Like the, He's trying to understand there that my dad... He was suffering and he made the ultimate decision. There is no bigger decision in life. Mm. Like you choosing to take your own life, there is no bigger decision. That's because, just what I see. It's just, there's yeah. no, there's no bigger. Like if I just try and think like if someone like you, someone's really close to you did that now, you'd be, it'd be catastrophic for me. Yeah. You know, a close family member. You, you, Cause you'd always be thinking, could I have done more? Mm -hmm. That's probably part of it for me. If you're like really looking at counseling, but what can an 11 year old kid do? And it's probably hard as an 11 year old kid to like, <clears throat> not, cause I don't know about you, but there, there, might, there must be some sort of animosity there and a bit of anger that like, oh, you fucking left up me and my sister at mm. this age. And, but like you say, it must've been in some position to, to I think it's, I decision. think it's always financial me. Do you think? The world we live in, men especially, we're built to provide, I believe that, right? Take all this Tate stuff out there. That's what I want to do. I want to, I want to go perform, I want to provide, I want to fucking be something. So, if that is pulled from you, that, that inability, and you're in debt or whatever might be happening, you might be gambling, you might be drugs, drink, your fucking relationship's falling apart. If that's, if, if that's what you've built your sort of character on, and that's what you're known for of being that person, and that gets taken away from you, to fucking then hang yourself, it's, mm. I still can't comprehend it. Because I've never been in that position myself to feel that. I've, you know, when you've been heartbroken, I don't know if you've ever been heartbroken through a bird and you're fucking de bit. devastated a to a degree. But like, listen, you know, in like, I've learned through ups and downs in life that things always get better. If you get back to your own discipline and you focus on your own path, like yeah. things will get, things yeah. will improve and get, get better. People just look at like the bigger picture and they think I'm never going to get back to that. Yeah. It just takes small steps to get back to it. Yeah. Speaking of which, the tri Triple T Golf you know, as mentioned, this guy. So we just had a new subscriber. He probably might be watching this Triple T Golf. He just it's somewhere local, <coughs> and in his in his bio on his YouTube, it says just no scratch golfers, just average golfers who like to like sort of basically walk and talk and play golf and do stuff for the mental health. So I've written his name down. I feel like we should probably reach out to him because I haven't watched any of his videos yet. I know he's just done one with Greg Eden. But we could help with filming as well, couldn't we? Yeah, and do I'm for presuming him? we could go, and that's the sort of things he'd talk about. Mm. I think it's a, like a Andy's Man Club sort of vibe. So. That'd be a good shout to do that. Like, if he's watching this, we'll get in touch with him anyway. I think that'd be good for vlog as well. Getting to golf, I know I'll probably smoke you at golf, but you want to, mate? I need some lessons, mate, before we start fucking. Doing that, <laughs> nah, that, I think it'd be, be funny just watching yeah. you trying to fucking. Yeah, because it's it's a skill game, but is it a patient get patience game Bro, as well? Golf. If you're playing, it's eighteen holes. You might play five or six holes. Your first five or six holes, shite or just average. You play one good hole, and you're like, oh, buzzing. I'm fucking. I'm back. You just do one bad shot and it just leads you onto down and spiral because every single shot after that, you want it to smoke it. Yeah. Should, I'll, I'll show these guys that I'm going to hit it as hard as I can. Bang, gets worse. I just visualise me breaking clubs. Bro, I broke two, I broke two in one round. Did you? Yeah. What, is that just a smash over the knee? One straight over the knee, one straight round a tree. Is it? Yeah. Expensive, like <laughs> 300 quid mistake just out from being fucking angry. Changing gears a bit, I do want to dissect your fight. We've, we've not really talked about that we released the vlog yesterday so for people who are watching that please give that some love there's plenty of work that goes into those vlogs and i'm quite for where we're at with the sort of content creation i'm quite happy how that came out how did the weekend go for you be honest yeah definitely need to be honest well obviously i had a fight change the week before and the guy that i was supposed to be fighting I'm not going to say he didn't deserve the respect of me training like a professional, but it definitely slowed me down in training and mentality and being as strict and motivated as I should have been for a fight, for any fight, you should still be prepared for it. So that lacked a little bit, maybe a little bit of an underestimation, underestimation for Juan, um, turning up in his Muay Thai t-shirt and jeans and shit like that and I was taking the piss. So that like didn't really put any fear into me. So I feel like I underperformed 100% in the fight Definitely probably just performed at like 30, 40% of my best day. It's that's significantly lower then, isn't it? That? Significantly lower. Like I, 
I, I've only watched it back once and I was like in daylight on my phone. So I haven't really had a chance to properly watch it. But I could see from the shots I were throwing in the like single shots, one and two shots, rather than coming forward and repeating an attack, I was just like throwing a couple of shots, getting back, mm. taking a shot. But I still feel, I definitely still got a clear win on him. It wasn't as if I, as it wasn't a close fight, but I just know that if I would have taken it more serious, warmed up a little bit better, got there a little bit earlier rather than panicking, um, I'd have probably put him away in first or second round. But all in all, the weekend were good. and Anticlimax was slim like. But... A big anticlimax mm. like, but um, it were a weird one with Slim's one. It was, it, it were crazy because I don't know if, we weren't really stood that close next to each other for the fight. I kind of stood with Emily, but I saw it myself and Slim said himself last night, you could see him as the fight went on rapidly decreasing in energy. Um, he lost that snap in his shots. He were taking shots that he wouldn't normally have been caught with. He'd have seen him coming, and it was just sad to see because when it got halfway through the second round, I like I can't remember why it might have been Ben. I was like, he's he's getting too tired. He's he's burning energy quick. And when you're in a fight like that against somebody who's dangerous, the last thing you want to be is drained and not see shots coming. And that's what happened. He got caught with that same shot two or three times in second, twice in third. And that last shot that he got caught with was just a dangerous, quite a powerful shot that obviously had a bad effect on on his health. Mm -hmm. um, what do you, we spoke to someone last night, and what does he have to do moving forward? Do you think, I'll ask you, and you can give what you want here, but do you think the rematch is a wise move? He seems adamant about it. I do, actually. I do think it's a good move. I think if he listens to people, because the thing I've noticed about Slim, you can give him advice and he, he takes it on board a little bit, but then he, he'll come back with, no, but this. Mm. So like, for instance, last night we were saying, I, uh, yeah, you drained from doing a weight cut, but UFC fighters and stuff cut more weight than that, look way more drained on the day and still perform 100% on the next day. It's not 100% down to getting that weight cut as long as you do the rehydration, refueling properly, which I'm presuming in a way he kind of did because he's got a coach and stuff telling him everything what he needs to do with nutrition. But he's the same as me. Yes, he drills. Yes, he does pads. He goes on these runs, but he's not building the the red line energy. He's not blasting himself. Mm. He's not he's not being an animal in some training sessions where his, his opponent who trains at Manchester top team, that some of the sessions they won't put boxing gloves on. They'll be there kicking a bag 300 times in 30 minutes. Like they'll be building that gas and that conditioning, which I think Slim's lacking. Yeah, I know he cut weight and the other guy presumably didn't because he did a video weighing and you could see that he just physically wasn't drained. But they'll have different engine levels. And yes, skill-wise, I think we could all see that they were both very skillful. Slim was up there, if not better, skill-wise than him, which he is with most of his fighters. But the thing about Slim is he can't keep that up. He can't keep it up throughout the full fight. And it doesn't just slow him down throwing shots. It slows him down blocking shots. It slows him down moving getting out of the way of shots. When he gets hit, when he's tired, you're more fatigued, you, you don't take it as well. Yeah. I think what he needs to do is really listen. I know he's starting SNC now, but also just building that energy up and not focusing less on the skill side of stuff, but definitely focus more on building that punch power up. So like you say, you've got that equalizer if you need it. If someone's coming in a bit reckless, yeah, you're tired, but if you can still land that one punch. Yeah, it, can, change, can change the course of the fight. Even if it doesn't knock him out or knock him down, it's still like, whoa, I'm not going to go as reckless here. I'm not yeah. going to start throwing these spinning back Makes fists sense. and shit like that. Why do you feel there then dissecting that? Do you feel like he, if you saw that from the, the, the audience, the fighter in front of him is going to 100% feel that? Is that a fair assessment, if that makes sense, what I'm asking? Yeah, bro, if, if 100%. And it's like, to, to put my fight into perspective, when I were throwing jabs at Juan in the first round and they were hitting him square on nose or on forehead, his head, he, he, yeah, it was moving back a bit. Boom, he's taking it, looking straight back at me, coming forward. I'm like, that, you throw three or four of them jabs, I could feel my shoulder getting a little bit tired, which it shouldn't have been for some reason. I don't think I did my warm up as well as I did for the BKB fight. If you throw five jabs at someone and it lands them straight on nose and they keep walking forward, it breaks you down a little bit. You, Do you, you mean start, mentally? Yeah, you start thinking, right, I'm going to start throwing straights now. And as soon as he, he kept doing a tie block, like rather than blocking it like that or parrying it, he just kept going. And just tie blocking. I thought, fuck me, my straight's not even getting through here. Then I finally realised that the body were a bit open more. And that should have really thrown more combos and, and mixed it what up. What would happen if you just got into a firefight with one then? Well, look, Is it 50-50 that then? <laughs> no, I, don't, I, still, I still think I'd have had it. With, I, I, like on the day, like I said, 30 or 40%, I could see that my speed and power wasn't there. My technique wasn't there. There's one, there's one of the pictures where I'm getting punched and one of my hands down here. Mm. Why the fuck were it down there? And I'm like, what the fuck are I doing? Obviously, I'm just like reckless throwing shots as I'm 
probably fatiguing and trying to let off a bit more than I think. As soon as I see his glove down, I'm like, fucking hands down, bang. But if it got to a firefight, I still think I would have just been sweet. I don't, I don't know why. I feel like I've got a solid chin. Like them pictures, and when I watch the video back, he does catch me with a couple of solid shots. But even when I sparred with Danny Christie, I was taking solid shots there. They didn't wobble me at all. They just like nudged me head a little bit. So I, I don't know. Um, but anyway, not to take attention from the Slims fight. So what I was saying is I could see that Juan's mentality when he was getting jabbed was solid. If you're throwing punch at someone and it's wobbling them a bit because they're fatigued and you can see them slowing down and you can see them like not reacting to a shot. This, the reason the kid threw the spinning back fist five times is because pretty much every time as soon as that kicked missed, kick missed, all Slim focused on was throwing a shot back. He didn't think about why he kept throwing that and it just wasn't registering in his mind. And that's not due to so his fight So what do you do IQ. there then? For, for me understanding <laughs> that then as just a fanboy, do you just circle away then when, he, when, he, when you can see he's going to start chucking that sort of... Because it was the same thing every time. Low kick, fake the high kick, and then it, it already detonated that spinning back fist. What, do you just move away? Well... Or do you try and gauge that I think he's going to do this and have a tell on it and then, there's, then there's, attack? There's no shot you can land that's going to beat a spinning back fist because you're in this... Let's say my opponent's here and I'm in this position. That, everything's covered. If you throw, if you throw a shot over top, that's covered. You can't really throw anything round here because there's someone coming here, so you'd just come short anyway. You could you could move back and then throw a kick and score a point. You're not going to knock them out after they've thrown a spinning back fist, but you watch what Slim does. He checks his kick, leans back, and then just straight away lunges forward with that. And unfortunately, it's all good and well if you've got that hand up tight, but he just didn't, and it just won't register in his mind. And he's got a good fight IQ, he knows, and he's been drilling to defend and throw them himself, so he knows when he's got full energy, he won't, he won't get caught with them. But he just was doing, and you could see it, and it was a bit. It was like it was sad to see that he kept. Does it just take? Him. Does it take a few weeks, maybe a couple of months, to that sink in fully of what happened on night? In his mind, yeah, I don't think it'll ever properly sink in. It's so, always there. Yeah, definitely. It, it was a weird one because I remember saying to you, it'll, it'll be hard for him to even remember warming up when mm -hmm. you get a knockout like that, which I didn't ask him, but it probably he probably can't remember warming up. He'll probably just remember flashes of the fight, and mm -hmm. then watching it back, he might remember a little bit more. Um, but when he was messaging me the next day, he was like, I don't think I want to fight anymore. It's really done this. Obviously, my mum were upset and this has happened. And I was like, if he if he'd have said I'm not fighting from now on, I'd have been like, understandable. Yeah. But then after a couple of days and he's, he's thought about it, he's, he's similar to me. He's like, all right, I want to fight him again. I want to fucking prove to this guy that he's not going to beat me if, we, if it's fair. And I know they've been going back and forth on comments and shit like that. I wonder if there's anyone's watching this who can... What, what's, what's the word even I'm looking for here? Adjudicate. To host that. Oh, to host it. Yeah, we... we that 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 if promoted correctly could be a big fight. It's just who is the promotion that will run with that storyline. Yeah, but I think anyone with a with a decent promotion who, who's watched that video and just if they just took a moment and time to be like, what this guy didn't weigh in for a professional fight, did a video weigh in, came in clearly bigger, landed a dangerous shot and got a win, and now they're having back and forth on Instagram. I want to see that rematch. Yeah, I want to see if he, I want to see if he, he's better on the day and and all these things that we're saying. The spinning back fists were illegal. He weighed in um, over a video weighing. Did that Did that dictate why he got knocked out? Imagine or, the perfect end to the story there if Slim can knock him out with that same yeah. shot. That would uh, be fucking yeah, great. Just drill right. that, becoming a fucking tank. Or this kid just throws that fucking spinning back fist again and Slim just moves and throws an head kick and cleans him out and be yeah. like, that, that. you didn't land that now, did you? Fucking yeah. idiot. So that would definitely be a good rematch. But I feel like they should just do it. For, if they're going to do it, February time, give Slim four or five months now to just train solid. You think it's a bad idea trying to move him away from the idea of having a warm up fight? Just focus on training camp now and just get straight back in February. That's what I do. I'd be wanting to find that same guy again. You don't want to. You don't want to have to get another opponent and have to focus on this guy's style yeah. and forget about his. I'd just be watching this Dagestani's fucking videos and fights constantly. And I'd be like, right, show me how to beat this Dagestani guy. That's it. Let's run it back in five months' time when I'm fresh and fucking hopefully stronger That's and bigger. One. That's what I'd be doing. That's the one. But uh, with me, we're fighting now. Um, once that fight was over and I got my hand raised, I'm like, <sighs> I were a bit disappointed in my performance and I'm like, it takes more than what I've been doing to put a good show on. Mm. Like, it went down to my skill because I've, I, I've got a decent fight IQ and I could, it was just down to like not having the energy and confidence in my own fitness to keep pushing them and keep piecing them up like that. Whereas if I had active fitness, because he didn't throw a punch on back foot, he'd throw one and then if that missed or hit my glove, he wouldn't throw anything, he'd just cover up and grab me. Mm. So I know that it's going to take more work than what I'm doing. I was playing at it really when I, I know I came back from Kingpin and said, I'm going to train like a fucking professional now. But You, you started off like that, it just it weaned off. But it's again discipline, bro. And which now... And I I've, probably, like, looking back, I probably weren't strong enough for you as accountability buddy there. Like, come on, yeah. mate, you fucking... That's but, what I need. But then what I felt with you, which, well, me being soft, is 
I'd respected your mindset that you're going to knock this man out. You yeah. know what I mean? And I looked at him, I'm like, yeah. like you said there, it's probably not a threat. So have you took it as serious? And then for one to step in, one shaking your hand at Wayne saying, nice to meet you. It's probably all these are, you Contribute probably need, you probably need someone who's like fucking putting it on you a bit like this. Tomorrow it's on. That's what I need. Do you know what I mean? Like tomorrow it's on. Mate. I need to get. I've, I need tra- to get, I've trained. I hope you have, bro. I need to get matched against somebody. The poster come out and even comment on it saying you fucking little pussy. You're getting smoked. Yeah. And then I'm like, right, let's see. Then then yeah. I, nothing else matters. I'm I'm in there. Disciplines in. But I feel like now if I do want to get back in the fighting, my disciplines there. Everything else, like I just said, once my disciplines in there, my works in there, my money's coming in. I can just focus on that thing and I can build everything. Well, ideally there. So let's thing. dissect that then. How, who? Is the opponent you want? Is it is it going to be on this misfit scene, this influencer scene? Is it going to be back into some? What, what do you want to do? Well, Warren's fighting on Crypto Fight Night in Dubai next month. I think I think it's three or four weeks away. I've been pestering the promoter there, which is James Piers or whatever his name is, who, who Amber's seeing. And by the way, when we predicted the thing and we were going to do the phone call last podcast, and I said, um, I'm sure Amber messaged me asking about the crypto thing, and she actually said like, Oh yeah. Um, that's the reason why. So I messaged James last week and I said, oh, well, whilst I was on holiday and I said, before I get fat, which I'm not going to get fat, but I'm trying to prompt him. Have you got any, any fighters that need to fight in Dubai? 75 to 80 kilo. And he replied saying, oh, the only person that I've got for you wants to fight a crypto influencer. So I just put, I'll put. What does this crypto influencer fuck mean? Fuck knows, bro. What, so you've got to just fucking store Bitcoin or what? Uh, that's what I said to him. I said, I'll, I'll buy a Bitcoin wallet and put it in my bio. <laughs> and he just, put, he just put a laughing face back. So That makes no sense to me. But if, but even though I'm saying, oh, I want to be deadly serious and ready for it, if I do get an opportunity like that, and he's like, three weeks notice, I'm like, fine. I'm still going to take that opportunity because it's a good opportunity for the brand. But I'd much prefer to get matched on a show in two or three months' time. That's, that. that's a set in stone one. But I don't just want to do a fucking sports hall in Wakefield fight. There's no point. I'm not really asked about actively selling tickets and getting ticket mm. money. Yeah, I'll have people watching it because there'll be people on my social media who will want to watch it through a link. But ideally, some sort of influencer show that's going to help the brand out that's got someone who's a cocky bastard like who Warren's fighting, that Jack Fincham, is 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 putting Warren down and he's saying, ah, oh, you just watch how it goes. If I can get matched against someone who's that cocky, who, still, who thinks it's going to beat me and put up a good fight, then I'll be buzzing to take it. There's people like... Well, I saw yesterday or day before, Daryl Kendall's now training with Jax O'Neill, who's obviously local, plays for local rugby team, is a bit of a apparent gobshite, bit of a boyo. But I'll probably get along with him. He's probably very, very similar to me. And Daryl hashtag misfits. So I replied to him, I'm like, oh, what's this? And he's mm. like, oh, yeah, he's, he's like he's fight talk and that there. And then I'm going to catch up with Daryl this week and ask what it's about. But I'm presuming we're probably about similar rate, uh, similar weight and he seems game. So I think if I put it on uh, Jack's O'Neill's toes it'd probably out of like being boisterous and being from this area and playing for this rugby team go alright then if you want it I'll fucking have it with you taking his athleticism away obviously a, a good athlete he's played rugby league all his career he's going to be tough aggressive can he will he even be able to match experience there can he can he can he compound that into let's say he's been boxing just for a couple of years and doing bits and bats working it around his sort of his He's done his, what he did, Love Island. Yeah. And then he's back into somewhat a training camp for rugby. Is he a threat? You, you see what these influencer boxers can do. I'm presuming <clears> he's <throat> got a bit of money and a bit of free time. So you, you see people like KSI who have been boxing for three or four years and how, what level they can get to. I'm not mm. saying KSI is a world champion, but people like Jake Paul probably been doing it for two or three years. He can achieve a lot in that time. He can get up to a good level. So let's say he has been boxing for two or three years and his experience is pretty decent. I just feel like, putting someone who's been training every day for two years against someone who's been doing it for 13, 14 years, like pretty steadily, but can take it serious if they need to. Um, I feel like my experience would outweigh him massively. Yeah, his, his, his athleticism's up there, and I know people say he's tough in rugby, he can dump people on the head, and he's... He's strong. 100% strong, I can't take that away from him. If you put two skilled fighters in against each other, it is the one who's got more dog in him and more athleticism and more equalizer power in him that's going to win the fight so yeah if he can if he can out athletic me then he'd have a good chance but if i get matched against somebody like that i know that the only thing separating me and him is that athleticism and that thing i just i just equal i just equal him on the training and i just turn myself into that monster which i know i can be and i've been plenty of times before i want this fight i know i wasn't I had the skill and enough cardio to, to do three two minute rounds. Three two minute rounds isn't enough for me to fight. I need to no. be fighting five or six minute. Uh, well, five or slims six were rounds. three minute rounds, weren't they? Slims were three three. Is that extra six, sixty seconds a lot of time? Massively, 
definitely a lot of time. And I notice that when I do pads. If I do two minutes on pads, it's done. It's fast. It's over. I'm, I'm still fresh by the end of it. If you do three minutes, you even feel when that second minute ends, when you're doing a three minute round on pads, you can feel it. I could check clock and I'd be on like two minutes and one second. I'm like, I fucking felt it in my body. Mm. Three minutes definitely is um, a big game changer. But I'd, I'd prefer to do five three minute rounds and just be able to take it at my own pace because I get better as the rounds go on, especially if my fitness is up there. So if he's watching this pod, Jax O'Neill, and you want to scrap a good one against the game motherfucker from Castleford, shout me. We can sell that. We can promote that fight. Hundred percent, bro. Yeah. I think. But the it's selling it to misfits. Like, do they want to put him against another influencer well, and let got, him power we, through? We, we've got to do a job of putting it out there, then, don't we? 100%. I think sometimes waiting on these, you know, James and whatnot, make your own ripple, mm-hmm. you make your own wave, you make your own, you build it. People will come. 100%. And they'll watch it, and that's that's that. That's what sports about for me. Yeah, at it's, that level, it's a tricky one for me as well because I'm. I like to be nice to people. I like to be sound. I like to have a you good relationship. It's not about being nice. It's playing game, isn't it? Yeah. Look, watch Misfits, mate. Everyone knows what it's about. Mm-hmm. It's, but it's, I, play, I played that game with fucking Callum Izzard and he fought on one of Misfits shows recently, and he fucking blocked me on Instagram, bro. He, he could clearly see I'm playing the game. He gets match. He get. He puts a video on boxing. I comment saying fucking absolutely horrendous, lets me and you have some smoke. He goes and looks at my profile picture of me doing BKB or whatever and goes, ah, thanks for the comment. And yeah, I'm maybe, like, no. Maybe we've got to take these BKB pictures off. Yeah. <laughs> Speak to YouTube and get to just delete all footage. <laughs> yeah. Just leave the cock pump videos on so everyone just thinks I'm a weirdo. I tell you what, we'll change gears again, but like, you know the cock pump, what's the, the guy called, Carl? Carl. He's helping Russell out. Is he really? Small world, mate. In what, in Spon- what sponsoring. Really? And Russell, Wait a minute. Russell, so Russell's one set Russell Meekin. Oh, 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 I know. So, I know. So Russ, don't, the, don't get me started on this. Bro, I know this. I is know that a joke? This. Russell help out eventually. It's just... Russell would probably help out if we asked him. I feel he didn't want to be the Zach's racing misconstrued with mm. OnlyFans. But, but the, bro, the, fun, the funny thing is that Russell did bring up to me the other day that two of the cars had OnlyFans all over the this side. This is what I'm saying. This is what I was just about to say. Every, bro, OnlyFans, yes, there's, there's things on so there. So Russell Meekin... Sponsor the pod. Fucking too, right? <laughs> it's not even just sponsoring the but like people like Russell who we're friends with who's actually got something got like we could have a sponsor now. It could be <laughs> Man, I'm gonna boot off in a minute. <laughs> we could have a sponsor now and it could be so and so fucking gardening. Like we what Yes, we can do things for them. We can film them the stuff, but we can't really go and fucking help them cut grass and be like, oh, look at us cutting grass. Yeah. With stuff like Russ, who's got something exciting going on, yeah. especially with the racing, bro. It's stuff that we enjoy. Yeah. And we're fucking lads. We can go and do stuff with a car thing. I think that'd be a good partnership with Russell. So we're going to clip this section. I'm going to send it to Russell. Fucking, fucking too, right, we're mate. Gonna, we're going to require that. Yeah, because he, was, he said he were handing all these dick pumps out at racing. Yeah, bro. He's, he's on it. He's Carl. Yeah. He's fucking all Smart over Smart for turning it to get into because I've all got money. Yeah. And apparently he said the technology's got better. What, so, it puts bath, a, so it puts a bit of girth on an inch on there. Fucking boys will be thinking, you know what? Let's go. Is it? It is a bit of added weight for drivers, though. They might want to avoid it. <laughs> but they do. Just walking about, massive chuck. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> You're 84 kilo once, girls. I'm like, 86. <laughs> Fuck's sake, make dicks heavy. Carl's just say like that. <laughs> go on, lads. Yeah, yeah no, he's, he's he's very smart of it. It's Carl. Like this is what I don't get about with Russ saying that thing about the OnlyFans thing. Like, they I think what has been put off. By Russ there is, I'm surmising, this is not a dig who's been helping Zach's social media out. I think they're very unaware of popular culture. Mm-hmm. I think they're very unaware of where the attention is right now. I watch what they post, mate. It's, it's average at best. Yeah. Not to be negative. They've probably gone from like writing in a newspaper or, yeah, a, or a magazine. Very, very traditional. This. Can't see the bigger picture and don't understand that sponsorship and attention is garnered through social media now. End of story. This is, the, this is the conversation we should be having with Russ, even in front of his people. Yeah. It'd be nice to, and I will not want to fucking ruffle people's feathers, but if you just say to, to Russ, like, your social media guys, can we meet him and just have a conversation? Go in the room with I him. I think he knows how that'll end now. Yeah, it, it, it'd end with them learning stuff from us yeah. and even wanting to work with us and be like, actually, yeah, I do see a perspective. Or Russ being looking at us both and being like, you two boys, help me out. Fuck you lot. You, you yeah. don't do, but sometimes you can't you can't convince people that social media and people editing stuff, uh, people like sponsoring a podcast or sponsoring a person who's a social media influencer can impact the sales way bigger than a magazine and a newspaper can, or even a fucking TV or a radio advert. They're dead at the moment. Mm. But it's like when we make these ads, and I'm like, trust me, we're getting fucking hundred thousand views or um, in- interactions, even just on a s- Instagram. Like, mine's grown to 156 now, 156k. 
And you're like a million now. Bro, mine's 2.5 million on my Instagram at the yeah. moment. But like that's been down to, I really think that's a nice little touch me is the collaboration. Collaboration. And mine's 154K. 100%. As soon as you, uh, bro, you, if you can, you can collaborate with three people now. If oh, you collaborate wrong. with three people and, and they get 100K international on each one, you, you've just then got 400K. Like it's a, they, He's like, playing that game with the social media. It's collaboration. Isn't it? If the goal is to get Ghana more customers or Ghana sponsorship money or whatever you, you, your goal is, Everyone knows it's on social media now. That's just where the attention is. You can't move away from that. It's getting yeah. worse and worse. I've just started back lifting me, and I take lifting quite serious. I go with my headset. Everyone is sat on the phone. Everyone. Mm -hmm. They can't even stop between sets. Right. Fucking hell. I said to Aidy, I'm like, no wonder, no. Like, when I was younger, everyone were jacked. Yeah. So there's going to be gyms around here, like Ultraflex, where those people will definitely live, and these big units knocking around. But you don't see anyone training that now. No. And I can see why some people, especially if they're not that interested in gym, they just do it every now and then. I can see why they give themselves a little bit of a, um, what's the thing called that you get in your brain when you go on? Dopamine hit. Dopamine hit from a... Yeah, but get it from fucking executing a working set. People don't see that. But on holiday, bro, so many couples, so many families, me and Emily had walked next to the pool. There'd be couples just laid there, so just fucking scrolling. We'd go upstairs to the bar. There'd be people just laying on the other side. I, I, like, I like looking at him yeah, like, I went, like I went if we ever get like that I, like end it I end feel embarrassed that you say this because I get a little bit like sort of night now because my day it's wrong because it's my wrong. my day is busy and let's say my missus she's she's good to me but let's just say she just wants an hour 45 minutes of attention you some this it's like a fucking gravitational pull to this mm -hmm. device and you have to use it to your advantage, not to your disadvantage. And being a consumer doesn't work. I shouldn't say this because I want everyone to fucking watch this, like, subscribe, yeah. but, like, have a have a balance with it. The, the, I think the balance and the viewers, how they can benefit from watching our stuff is a lot of people, especially ones that I talk to, they do a lot of driving, so they'll put it on whilst they're driving. Yeah, and what we do sweet. here is long-form information. It's like we, we've, we have this conversation back and forth of what we should be making and, you know, focus on short little clips, but... Our game is the ability to speak and unpack stuff at length and try and dissect that. And people need attention spans. Mm. People need to be able to focus for for long amounts of time to be able to grasp any information. Gavin, who I listen to, I'm not a Pierce Morgan fan. I don't know enough about him. But he seems to get people who were very relative to the what's going on. So he like had a Palestinian guy on there. Obviously, there's conflict going on. I don't know enough about it, but... They were on there for 30 minutes, maybe 45 minutes, and you can't unpack anything in that. And the first 30 minutes is them just arguing their point. Mm -hmm. you, to to have any sort of breakdown and understanding of it has to be long form. You need three hours. I don't get why, do and I surmise this isn't why people like Rishi Sunak and people who are in power right now, why haven't they got a podcast? So they can at least unpack it at length. You just watch them at Prime Minister's questions, all this bullshit they do, or... Little two and three minute uh, segments. Bro, they can barely fucking answer a reporter's question. Yeah. People like that. They they don't want to sit down for three hours and get the brains picked. They're fucking terrified of doing that sort mm. of stuff. It's madness. I do want to bring up before we got a fucking dash here. Just the last <clears throat> point that I want to bring up is we won't do a UFC recap. But if people have, haven't watched that, watch the Usman and Shamaya fight. Dave Courtney, we've touched on, but I want to. We're going to watch it on the Francis Ngannou. Tyson Fury fight. They've been building that up all week. I'm invested heavily into that now. What day is that? It's this weekend. It will oh, be shit. Saturday, and it's because it's in the it's in Saudi Arabia. We'll be able to watch it at a reasonable time. That's why I like the UFC this weekend. It uh, prelim started at three o'clock. Main card started at six. It was done for nine. That's perfect. She wanted to watch it. We got to watch that, and that it's fucking. But that <laughs> me 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 things telling me that Tyson's just going to stop him fairly early. But imagine if Francis clips him. That is a huge upset. Bro, Tyson and Fury. And Francis looks massive. And Tyson in the I'm, Tyson Fury will back himself every day of the week. He's, he's, he's undeniable of his skill set. Is he underestimating him? Because he keeps saying, well, I've sat and traded with Deontay Wilder, who definitely is a powerful, powerful knockout artist. But look at, I know you shouldn't go off rigs. It's not a bodybuilding show. Go off Deontay Wilder's physique. Big, I think he's like 230, 230. Francis will have to cut weight for this fight if there's a limit on it. His legs, everything is built for power. Mm. I just hope, you know, I want you to just touch on this to finish. Like, Will he just come out there and try and fight him? He's not going to come out there and try and box him. Bro, 
I've, I've, there's been no recent footage of Francis Ngannou's boxing, but I can't imagine it being great at all. He's oh. just got that big hand. Yeah. But if he does land that big hand, he will probably what, just come him. in, just start hooking, hooking, just trying to flurry him. Yeah, but it's it's going to be a game of Tyson Fury is so smart and so alert. He could probably have his hands down and just do that and get out of fucking Ngannou's way. Like I think for Ngano to catch him, Tyson's got to be off. He's got to have an off day. He's got to he's got to get caught with a shot through glove that wobbles him a bit first. Then maybe another shot that might catch him. But if mate, if if Francis Ngano, a UFC fighter, can go in there and box and beat Tyson Fury, what does that say about boxing? There's like mm. he's fought against the best in the world and he's beat him and he's beat him twice. So I cannot see a UFC fighter who's not got that great at boxing. Yeah, he's got power. It's like. F- you can't, bro. I'd put a lot of money on Tyson Fury from doing it. Maybe not stopping Engano. I think he'll probably play a long game against him and just cat and mouse him for the full fight. But I reckon he can do. And I reckon mm. if there's anything that's. I wonder how serious he's taking it because he did say in the interviews that he's had a full training camp. But I know Francis has come over there, got acclimatized, full shakeout, got used to fighting at a certain time, different time zones, different food, different culture, different water, all these variables. I wonder if Tyson, being the Gypsy Kings, just fucking strolled in, probably on a fucking economy flight. And just fucking just think, fuck it, let's do it. No, nah, I don't think he'll have done do that. Do not think? No, I think there is that Do you think facade. he just leans into that facade? Yeah, that's it. I think he, he likes to get pictures taken on Ryanair flights. He'll probably just do that once here as a publicity stunt. Yeah. Not going to lie, he'll do yeah. that. He's, he'll get told, right, we're going to book you a Ryanair yeah, flight. Yeah, but the people's yeah. champ. Yeah, people share that. That picture will go viral. You'll be relevant. Then we'll pretend that you're leaning into this. We'll but he's got a private jet flying. Bro, right? he's got fucking, yeah, and he's been there six months. Yeah. Maybe, maybe not, but he's, yeah. he's, he's doing all the right things. He's yeah. not going to He's not going to let Engano have that 1% on anything. No. I want to watch that though. It's definitely got me attention. Yeah, find out what time that's on. We'll definitely yeah, we'll find we'll, that. We've got to watch that. I've I've pulled my uh, diary out. Uh, not my diary. I've pulled my calendar out for the first time. It had dust on it. Like, <laughs> I'm gonna. I want to get that full. So we've got a little bit of time now. We'll. we'll I think lean into these day in the lives. Are we gonna honor this one? Get Amber. I lean into your degeneracy because I do like Amber, and she's been good to the channel. Her and Danny Christie have brought a lot of views and a lot of yeah, attention yeah. to to the channel for us. So I think it's only right. We probably we did Danny Christie day in the life. We do. We do Amber next. Yeah. She's into some fucking weird stuff that I like though. Not the fucking Gungeon that before you fucking <laughs> rip into me, but like she's a fucking Harry Potter fan. And like, yeah. I saw her other day just fucking making the making ones, ones and that's shit. That's cool though. That's cool, I, think mate. That's like, that, I don't care what anyone says. She and fucking... actually, actually, I know obviously she's an OnlyFans creator. She's actually good at creating stuff. I think she's she, smarter than she lets off. She's definitely smarter than she lets off, but also she's way more talented than what you'd think she is. Like the stuff that she basically, Kieran Hart's missus uh, Nicole. Part time, she'll make canvases and put paintings on, and I see her updating pitch on. Yes, she works full time, but it'll take her like five days to seven days. Mm. I seen Amber make one other day in a day, like painted it, put the stencils on. She's it's, obviously just, it's speed, mate, is the key there. Like yeah, some definitely. people just have that speed component to them. I'm a big believer in that. Yeah, mate. and I think she's leaning into how much time she's got in her hands, and she knows I can get this done in a day. I've got the money coming. I can get this done in a day, and she she does well herself. I think she'll be able to like kill we'll anything. Get, get into her rib to. today. We'll try and get that recorded I, next I'll, get, of I'll weeks. give her a call today, and we'll get that like maybe even booked in for next week. Yeah. Sweet. Get down! Paid the cost to be the boss.